All right, we're going to start now. So uh, I hope you guys are not drowsy from the dinner. But uh, today we have uh, Peter Valchev from the Google security team. And he'll be talking about using OpenBSD to find security bugs. And he's been an uh, OpenBSD developer since 2001. So uh, everyone, please welcome Peter. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks. So before I start into the talk, I just uh, want to tell everybody this is, I want this to be kind of informal, so don't be shy. I'm going to be asking some questions, or you can ask me questions at any time. Uh, if I'm going too slow and it's too easy for you, or you want to speed up, or, or the opposite, or you want to slow down, just let me know. Um, I have a bunch of posters here, as you can see. They're pretty cool posters. They're not lame like some Windows XP posters or something. <laughs> and uh, I'll be giving them away for free. So if you, when you answer a question, just come down and grab one. And when they run out, don't worry, because they have some cool stickers, too, and they're over there. OK, so uh, I know that uh, some, not everybody here uh, uses OpenBSD for sure. But I'm wondering how many of you, first of all, have heard of what OpenBSD is? Oh, that's really cool. So how many of you use it or have used it? Awesome. That's what I want to see. <laughs> so well, I'll give a, an overview of OpenBSD anyway, even though it seems like most of you guys know what it is. So first. Uh, it's based on, the, uh, on BSD, which stands for Berkeley Software Distribution, because it was uh, originally developed, BSD was originally developed at the University of California at Berkeley. And that started in the 1970s. But the, in the beginning, people didn't care about licenses and such things. The first uh, freely distributable release with the current, what we call BSD license, was released in June 1989. And from there, uh, th this original BSD license that I mentioned, the key thing about it is that it's free to use by anybody for whatever they please. And there's only uh, a couple of restrictions, really. First, you have to pertain the copyright notices in the files when you modify them. And second, uh, this is the advertisement clause. If you make a product based on this code, uh, you were supposed to give credit to the University of California somewhere in your documentation. And this technical clause has been removed. So basically, this stuff is free. And as far as free goes, it's, it can't get more free than that. GPL, in comparison, which I'm sure many of you know with Linux, uh, requires uh, vendors who use this code to give back so it's kind of hard to, for companies to keep their intellectual properties. So that's why we believe that uh, we, we strongly believe in BSD. And of course, there's pros and cons to either. I'm not going to get into to anything here. <laughs> and uh, so first, uh, in 1993, there were two projects that were formed. And one of them was NetBSD, and it, it, was, it catered to the more technical users at the time. They aimed to support as many hardware platforms as possible. At the same time, FreeBSD was started by another group of individuals, and they to the less technical users, and they just wanted to make it really easy to use. They made it available in CD-ROM and things like that. And OpenBSD started two years later, and it forked off of NetBSD. So now that I've done some of the brief history, uh, I want to tell you why OpenBSD is cool, I think. <laughs> so first, uh, there's quite a bit of culture around the project. It's, uh, it's kind of like a family atmosphere. We have a small number of developers. And when I say small, it's about uh, 100, which as far as these types of projects go, it's, uh, it's relatively small. We have uh, hackathons every year, which are basically a week in the year where everybody takes the time off to get together in one place and uh, work on the project together. It's really cool because it leads to very rapid development. Uh, everybody takes the time off from their job and their family, and all they do is hack. And sometimes that's very, there's very little sleep at those events. And the other thing we do other than hacking is, of course, drinking. And uh, there's a lot of that. <laughs> and it's really cool to meet people and uh, to put the faces to the names that you've been working with all year long. We also pride ourselves in having a very clean code base. And by that, I mean is that we have a very strict uh, set of co uh, style guidelines. And uh, we constantly work on keeping our code as clean as possible. It's very easy for an outsider to jump in. And if you want to improve a certain area of the system, it's very easy for you to understand others' code. We also use uh, CVS. And uh, it's, we have an anonymous CVS service, so anybody can monitor our changes pretty much in real time. We have a mailing list where every single CVS commit goes to. So it's very easy for somebody to get involved because they can see what each one is, is doing. And I think that's pretty cool. And that's how we get uh, new developers all the time. And I'm kind of trying to say what you guys, so maybe some of you can be interested. So we also have been have made a lot of noise in the past few years with uh, open source advocacy. And we basically think that we should use the BSD license as much as possible. And that has actually made us, we have went through the whole source tree and audited every single file to make sure that the license is what we want it to be. We, in the process, we found a bunch of files that didn't have licenses or they had some little mistakes. So we contacted each other and, and fixed it for the most part. The ones that we couldn't fix, we rewrote the files. And of course, we still have some GPL code, in, like, the, like the compiler. And we still can't get rid of that. But we want to. 
<laughs> so we also, uh, there's also a lot of noise being about device drivers recently. We've, we've been approaching vendors asking for free documentation, which makes it easy for us to write drivers. And unfortunately, a lot of the other vendors haven't really helped us, such as Linux. And that's kind of sad. For one example is the Ethereum wireless driver. Uh, even FreeBSD is actually using a binary driver provided by Ethereum. And uh, one of our guys reverse engineered it and wrote a free driver. And actually, Linux is starting now to pick it up. But anyways, these are some interesting things uh, about OpenBSD, I think. And now I'm going to jump into talking about security. So OpenBSD is famous because our number one goal is security. That's what everybody thinks when they, when they hear the word OpenBSD. So we have an uncompromising view towards security. What I mean by that is that if we were a company, we would have clients and customers to please. We couldn't get away with some of the stuff we do. But as it is, this is a completely volunteer-driven organization. And we can do pretty much whatever we want. So we, we've put uh, our number one, goal to, number one goal to be security, and we can kind of keep to that. Our system is also secure by default. And what this means a couple of things. First, we, we don't enable a lot of things by default, because most people don't need to run an NFS server, for example. And uh, the second thing is that uh, we also have audited a lot of the base system applications to be as secure as possible. And what, he's, what this has meant is that in the past 10 years, we've only had two remote hosts in default installation. And that's, I think, a pretty impressive record by itself. When we got, I remember when we got the first remote hole, people started bickering on the mailing list and saying, like, ah, ha, ha, you no longer can say you didn't have any holes. Whatever. I think that's still pretty impressive. We also uh, design and incorporate existing cutting-edge security technologies all the time. We try to make this our priority. And we, we, have a, uh, we use cryptography very strongly throughout the system. And OpenBSD is based out of Canada, in Calgary. And there are no export restrictions to cryptography in Canada. Many other countries, such as the US and many European countries, there are restrictions. So if OpenBSD were based somewhere else, we'd have to worry about that. Uh, some examples of this, uh, our password files are encrypted with the, blow hash, uh, the Blowfish cipher by Bruce Schneider. Most systems use MD5 or 3 ds which is much weaker. So if your password file managed to get leaked, it would be much harder to brute force it. We also encrypt our swap partition by default. The reason for that is that maybe your application, even if it's secure, is going to, it stores passwords, for example, in the swap file if it's swapping at that time. And there's techniques used to, to use that information. So we encrypt our swap partition by default. We also have support for hardware uh, cryptography devices to make it faster. And uh, as I mentioned, auditing. So the cool thing, I think, is when we find a bug in the tree somewhere, chances are people have made that mistake for a reason. Maybe the documentation wasn't clear, or just an all-around general, generally easy mistake to make. So we go through the horror source tree and make sure that we fix the bug elsewhere. And usually that finds at least several other places. It's sort of being proactive about it. Okay, so the main idea of this talk is going to be, I want to convince you that uh, we've created a very hostile environment in OpenBSD for applications to run in. And this environment allows us to find many bugs in applications. And some of these bugs would actually just silently misbehave on, your other, computer, on other computers, such as Linux. And they're still bugs, and they still may cause bad effects, which is really hard to debug. So some of these problems we, we, have, we have caught. Now, when we talk about uh, changing some of these things, there's a, there's a few things to, to worry about here. First, there's a POSIX standard, which defines what Unix should be, basically. And there's the ANSYS C standard. So we have to kind of adhere to those. We, can, we cannot break POSIX, because third-party applications won't run on OpenBSD, and we don't want that. So even though we have to constrain ourselves to these things, we still have a lot of uh, room to play and to interpret the remaining things we can do. OK, so just a quick poll of the audience. So how many of you have had uh, your machine compromised? <laughs> what happened to yours? <laughs> OK. Interesting. Anybody else? <laughs> cool. You guys feel free to grab posters, by the way. <laughs> so uh, one of the things to note is a security bug is really just a bug. And the only reason it becomes a security problem is because attackers understand how to leverage the side effects that it creates to, revert, to divert program flow just to the way they want it. So I want to quickly mention some of the security technologies we have uh, inside OpenBSD. I'm not going to talk about most of them in detail. The last four are pretty much the ones that are going to be in the next slides, so I'm going to leave those for later. 
But first, uh, we have these string functions called strlspy and strlcat. They basically are string copy and concatenation functions that take a size as an argument, and they make sure your string is null terminated. In fact, it's kind of strange that the, the C standard library doesn't have these functions because there's really, we've seen so many bugs in the last 10 years that have been created because of this. First, uh, go ahead. Uh, it does not null terminate. So you have to remember to null terminate every time you use NCR and copy. So in fact, it, being, it ends up two or three lines of code. So it's, it's kind of easy for people to get it wrong, which they do. So that's, it, it's a very simple thing. But these functions make sure that they do this properly. And may, in one line, you can do the same thing. And these functions are actually a part of all the BSDs and Solaris and a bunch of other commercial operating systems. Linux is the only one that hasn't picked them up to put them in GDPC. And that's some political problems there. <laughs> But uh, OK, so some of the other things we've done is we've done a lot uh, in the area of memory protection. And this is going to be talked about later in the stock. We've also, there's also uh, two things that I want to mention. This, the, these technologies that we've tried to, it's kind of hard to call them technologies, but there's two ideas that we've tried to, to make our software use. First, this privilege revocation. The idea behind this is that uh, there's a lot of software, there used to be, now we've, we've changed this, but there used to be a lot of software on the regular Windows machine which uh, was set to ID root, so it had to run as root because it needed to do certain things as root. So any user had uh, access to it. And the thing is, most people, most applications don't actually need to do much as root. So what's one way to fix this? Well, you can, if, a, if an application needs it only for something small, you can do it as the first, let's say, first three lines in main. You can allocate that resource. And then you revoke privileges to some other user which doesn't have rights to do much. So one simple example of this is ping. And it's a very simple example, but it's easy to illustrate to see what it does. So ping needs a, a raw network socket, and for that you need to be root. So that's why ping is set to ID root on any machine. So what we did is we changed ping, the first three lines, allocate a raw network socket, keep it for later, drop privileges. So the other thing is for more complicated uh, programs in daemons, such as SSH, they need to use, they need root privileges throughout their lifetime. So in this case, you can't uh, drop privileges. So it's not that simple. So we developed a technique called privilege separation which is much more complex, and it's much harder to write it as a programmer. The idea behind this is that you split the application into two processes. One of them is really small, and it runs as root. And the other process contains the rest of the code, let's say 99% of the code, and it's running unprivileged. The main program run, runs unprivileged, and when it needs to do a certain task as root, it communicates with the other process over a socket pair, and it, does, it gets those tasks done for, done for it. And if you find a bug in 99% of the code in SSH, even if you manage to exploit it, you get this unprivileged user. So there's other applications that, that are able to benefit from this, and a lot of them haven't picked up on this, which uh, is something to be improved on. So we also run a lot of applications in a ch root jail, and uh, we've sprinkled a lot of new UI user IDs throughout our system. And the reason for that is that in the beginning, when everybody started doing this, they uh, made their applications use the user ID nobody. So let's say you're Apache, your name server, everything's running as nobody. So what happened if somebody compromised your name server? Then, let's say they had, they had a shell as nobody. And uh, assuming they couldn't break out of that and get root privileges locally, they automatically had access to your Apache and other configs. So when you, when you have a new user ID for each application, it kind of limits that. And it's, that's an extremely simple thing to do. But I think it's good to do it anyway. OK, so I just, I'm sure this is like basic for an, an review for most of you. But just a quick overview of what stack buffer overflows are. There's this function, foo. It takes a string as an argument. And it allocates a local buffer of size 10. And it copies a string to the buffer. So in this case, there's no, I'm sure most of you will notice that there's no size anywhere. So maybe the size is checked somewhere before this function is called. But assuming that's not the case, what will happen? So first, if we get an input smaller than 10, then everything is fine. But otherwise, Otherwise, what's going to happen is it's going to keep writing. The first 10 bytes are going to be written into, into buff. And after that, it's going to keep writing into the stack, onto the stack. So the way this is leveraged by traditional exploits is one simple way is to overwrite the return address. The return address holds the address of the instruction to execute right after this function returns. So in this way, in this way if an attacker can overwrite it, they can redirect program flow to an arbitrary location in memory that they control and take uh, control of your program. OK, so one of the things that uh, is really cool to defeat these stack overflows is Propolis. Propolis was developed 
by a Japanese guy named Eto. He worked for IBM Japan at, on the research department. So he, he implemented this protection for GCC. And that was about 2001, 2002. And he was really trying to sell it to people at the time. And if, unfortunately, nobody was really listening to him. And we were kind of the first ones who said, hey, you should like, come, come play with, come put it in OpenBSD and we can, together we can work to improve this. And of course, when we first put it in OpenBSD, there were a ton of bugs. There was like stuff breaking left and right because GCC is not very simple to modify. <laughs> so of course he made some mistakes. So it took us, I would say, at least six months, maybe to a year, or maybe even more to, to make uh, Propolis be stable. And in that time, we couldn't really enable it by default because we didn't want the bugs to affect us. But uh, after this one year, when things got ironed out, we enabled it by default. And the way it works is it protects uh, programs by inserting code into them when you compile them. So this actually became a part of GCC for about, I don't know, in the last year probably, since version 4.1, I think. Maybe some of you can correct me. But uh, it's now a part of GCC, but as far as I saw, I don't see any Linux distribution shipping with it enabled by default, so you have to, you have to do it yourself. I think that everybody should enable it by default. But anyway, so how it quickly works. So it inserts protection code in each function that it deems uh, that it's necessary for, for it to be protected. For example, if your function doesn't use any stack variable, any, any buffers on the stack, then it doesn't need this protection, obviously. So it's a quick optimization. It uses some heuristic checks to determine which function is applicable. Then each function has a, a proc prolog, which is basically the code executed right before the function enters the main body. And there's an epilog, which is executed before the function returns. So it, uh, it modified GCC to insert this code to each program. In the prolog of the function, each, pro each function generates a random integer, 32-bit, called a canary. And it puts it on the stack before the local arrays. In the epilog of the function, it checks and verifies that this canary hasn't changed. And if it has, it just kills your program. Go ahead. Where is the uh, you store the error? Uh, just, it just keeps it, uh, I'm not actually exactly sure <laughs> right now. But it's not, uh, hmm. I mean, it's pretty, pretty easy for the program to keep track of it somewhere else where an attacker can't uh, write to it. Yeah, we yeah we use this thing called RC4 random, which is based on the RC4 stream cipher. So it's actually not it's really it's really cool actually, <laughs> and you should read about it because it's a it's a software random generator thing, which is really based working on the like RC4 cipher by RSA. <laughs> so one extra thing that probably oh sorry. Yeah. No, that's, that's taken care of through our interface that we call it as. And we've renamed it to, it's actually called ARC4 because there's a patent, I think, and there's a trademark on RC4 by RSA. But you should look up ARC4. So an extra thing that Propolis does is it uh, reorders the stack and it puts the buffers closer to the canary. And this does two good, two good things. First, uh, if you overflow a buffer, it's more likely to hit the canary because it's the closest to it, and that's the obvious one. And second, Flags and local integers and pointers are further down. So this could contain some flag in your program. Let's say your program does password authentication. There's a Boolean called is authenticated. If you manage to, uh, to mangle that to make it, to make it, set it to true through just a, a simple four bytes, let's say, buffer overflow, uh, you could cause the program to do something uh, which you want it to do, even without overriding the return address or doing anything else. So having the, having the flags below is an extra, an extra protection. And the cost we measured was about 1.3%. And this is really no impact. And it's, everybody should just do it, I think. <laughs> uh, oops. And this is an il illustration of uh, what would happen if one of the arrays got overflowed. The canary would be modified. And uh, I'll do a quick demo, actually, just to show you how it sort of works. So there's a, just a really, really simple program. So it allocates a buffer size 10, and uses the get function to fill it in from standard in. That's very naive, but so it's, if I enter something small, it's fine. If I enter something big, it crashes. And if I look at it in GDB, um, it got killed. Oops. 
by the stack smash handler, which is basically propolis. Additionally, there's a log message on the system logged by syslog, and an administrator is able to see what applications have been crashing. It's really good for debugging problems and stuff. Okay. So now that, uh, now that I've uh, sort of explained all core, please, I hope it's clear to everybody. So before I, I want to talk about something else, and I want to show this, this really simple, stupid program. I want to see if some of you can find the bug as quickly as possible. So let me know what's the bug in that program. Uh, yeah, str dub calls malloc. str dub does malloc. And don't worry about error checking. Assume it succeeds. Yeah. Size so a pointer, you mean? Yeah. Great. <laughs> so now I'm gonna. So this is actually. Oh, does somebody else want to say something? Yeah, I, I just said assume it succeeds. I just didn't want to blow up the code on the screen. But yeah, the size of a pointer always returns four on, on i386. <laughs> it'll return something different from the 6 4 architecture. <laughs> Actually, does anybody know what it will return? Yeah. <laughs> cool. And you guys can grab posters, by the way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, that's, that's the point. But people, it's very. It's kind of hard to see sometimes when you look at it. And a lot of people make this mistake because they change, let's say the program was using a buffer initially, and then they changed it to use malloc, and they forgot to change everything. We've seen, with this, we've actually find, found dozens, if not hundreds, of bugs. And with the next technology I'm going to describe. So this is a really, a really, really simple static checker we added to GCC. It's this warning option called wbounded. What wbounded does is it performs basically a static analysis to make sure that the bound length passed to common functions matches the real length of the buffer. So this works for pretty much all the libc functions that take a size as argument. And it has a very big limitation right now that the buffer has to be statically allocated. It has to be known at compile time. And uh, this makes it not as, as cool as it, as it should be. But GCC is actually really hard to, to modify and to write stuff for. So the guy that wrote this initially was having a really hard time to expand it. And with another compiler, it might be easier. And this is another example for SNPNF. Now, of course, these contrived examples are sort of easy to see. But when, we, when you compile a huge application with this warning enabled, you can spot uh, bugs quite a lot. You'd be surprised how many people make these types of mistakes. And quick demo here. So there's this program. I'll let you look at it for a bit. Oh, that's the same program, actually. Never mind. So uh, if I compile it with uh, GCC, and I enable all warnings, which this one is a part of, it spots that. It tells me, warning, size of pointer is possibly incorrect. And now you go back to your program, and of course it's obvious then. So this is just a very simple technology, like I said. But it's been very effective to, at finding bugs. The next part of the talk, I want to talk about uh, some of the randomization efforts we've done. So some of you here have, a lot of you here have poked around with exploits and things. So I'm sure this is, again, sort of a uh, review. But exploits rely on, the, on predictable system behavior. So each time you run a program, a lot of exploits rely, let's say, if you're going to override the return address, you rely on the fact that it's going to be the same offset from your buffer each time you run the program, and things like that. So we've, we've tried to, to cause exploit writers hell as much as possible. So we've tried to cause the environment to be very non-predictable. The first thing is this, this thing called stack gap. The coolest thing about stack gap is it's a three-line change to the kernel. It takes two minutes to write it. And it inserts a random size gap in the stack between the buffers and the rest. And what this, what this uh, means is that uh, if an attacker needs to reach, let's say, the return address, it's going to be a different offset each time the program is run. Some of the other things we've done is uh, LD.SO is a dynamic library loader. So when you run a statically, uh, dynamically linked uh, binary, 
this is what's responsible for mapping the libraries into the right places. So on a normal system, it's predictable to know where each library will be mapped. So if an exploit needs a function from, let's say, libc, they will be able to, to find it in the address space. If we map li libraries at random memory location each time a program is run, this is going to be very difficult. The second thing we did is we also loaded the libraries in a random order to make it even more confusing for people. So that's, I think, pretty cool. So next, uh, I'm going to talk about mmap and malloc in the next slides. So mmap is a system call on Unix which maps files and devices into memory. The way it works is it has sort of two modes that we're concerned about here. You can actually specify to mmap where in memory you want to map your file or device. You can give it the address. And that's specified with a map fixed uh, flag. In that case, we can't do anything. But otherwise, if a programmer doesn't need that, which is 99% of the case, of, of the times, then again, we map it randomly somewhere on the heap. And uh, this actually still complies to POSIX because there's no, nothing that says that you can't do that. And again, if, if your exploit relies on something being mapped in the right place, it creates, makes that impossible. So malloc, uh, something similar about malloc. Each time, uh, on, on Linux, for example, the addresses returned by malloc are quite predictable. So we decided, well, let's, uh, in ours were too, almost all systems. So we decided, well, can we change that? What, what is it going to break? Well, it shouldn't break anything because who cares where it puts it in memory? Like you get the address returned and you just access it there. So there's, uh, as far as malloc goes, there's two modes of operation. First, uh, if your object is less than the page size in the architecture, line 3 to 6, this is 4K. Then malloc maintains an internal bucket of chunks of, of the small memory. And it, we just change it to return a random one. If it's larger than the page size, so larger than 4K in line 3 to 6, then we just use mmap. And mmap automatically gives us the randomization that I just talked about. Quick demo. I wrote a small stupid program. It all does is allocates two strings, size 100 and size 10, and it prints their addresses. So just to, just to make just to show you that this works. So each time I run this program, it's, it's mapped differently. And I have a Linux binary, which is statically linked and running under emulation. Each time I run that, I get the same thing. I hope that's convincing. <laughs> Well, this is all in virtual memory. Oh, okay. Yeah. So then we thought, what else can we change in malloc which might help us here? So we have these things called guard pages. The idea is that if you make an allocation with malloc of a page size or greater size, then immediately after the memory allocated, we put a page called a guard page. And every access of that page is going to cause your program to crash. This catches a lot of bugs where people, for example, read or write one, one byte too far. Go ahead. Do you have a question? Um, and it, uh, we also added other things such as malloc zero to crash. This actually, if, the, we, if we had that earlier, it would have prevented the SSH exploit. It was the first hole we had. It's basically nobody should, should use malloc zero. But, uh, these are still not enabled by default because there are a lot of uh, third-party applications which basically read or write one byte too far. And usually it's pretty innocent for them to do that. So nobody notices it. I like to run with this option and sometimes it exposes interesting bugs. But we haven't enabled it by default yet. And I'll show you a quick demo of how it works. So. So I, this program just allocates 8K. And then I have a for loop which accesses an, each byte and writes zero to it. And I go, I go one byte too far here. Just see what would happen. So normally this wouldn't, go ahead.
Oh, that's actually a very good question. We don't do that. And uh, if we did it, it would, help, it would save a lot. Of, it would catch a lot more bugs. And uh, the, I'm not actually sure exactly because I think it could be done, but it's not done. But it, it'll be cool. I was actually thinking about that when I was doing this example, because I first uh, used something else and didn't land on the page boundary, and then yeah, it needs to cross a page boundary. So good question. So I'll just uh, run this program, and it should crash, and it does. So something really important here. So many exploits rely on the fact that, sure, they're going to, let's say an, an exploit will overwrite your return address. So he has to point it somewhere where he has something interesting stored for, for the certain types of attacks. There's attacks where you don't, he doesn't need to do that. But. So we decided, why does the address space have any places where you're allowed to both write and execute? You don't, uh, you don't actually need to do that. So we decided, what would happen if we made a generic policy for the whole address space where a page can be either writable or executable, but not both. We call it W, XOR, X for the XOR operator. So this is actually very easy to do on most CPUs, such as ARM, AMD64, Spark64, because they have a per page execute bit. Sadly, the i386 does not. So for i386, this is not possible to do on a per page level, on such a fine-grained level. So we've done some other tricks there, which are quite long to explain, so I'm not going to get into them in the stock. But we've, also, we've, we've done our best to implement this on i3.6 and PowerPC as well. This doesn't really have any false positives or any downsides to it. Uh, we found a few bugs, but ba basically applications made incorrect assumptions that this is going to work. But POSIX doesn't say that this should work. So we just fixed those applications. And we still conform to all the standards. This is one of the most important protections that we have. So I imagine most people these days use either a PC or a Mac. So do any of you ha here have, oh, go ahead. Uh, can you explain why that's uh, so important? Uh, oh, it just makes it very hard to, to write anywhere to, for like a bad person to write anything in your memory. It's very simply said, which a lot of exploits rely on. Does that answer it? Or? So most people use either i3.6 or Mac PC, like Mac, Mac laptops and desktops. Do any of you here, how many people have actually used other types of hardware? Like, what kind? <laughs> MIPS? Okay. Cool. <laughs> cool. How about you? Cool. Anyway, if, uh, like, I'm sure all of you have cell phones. Most of the cell phones run ARM CPUs these days. So. OpenBZ supports, uh, it runs on 12 different architectures. This is really cool because uh, it allows us, it actually, it's actually allowed us to catch many machine independent bugs regardless of the CPU you're running on. That's because sometimes a certain behavior is only going to be exposed on one type of hardware, but it's going to be a problem on, on all of them, which is just harder to detect. And usually when uh, in general application writers, they don't, people don't really think that somebody's going to run their application on another architecture. Like let's say I'm, running, I'm writing a little program at home which is open source and I'm using my Linux desktop and I don't really care about having it run elsewhere else, anywhere else. But it's good to think about this because oftentimes people take this code and, write it and run it somewhere else. This also creates uh, security problems sometimes. So some of the things that people get wrong, they don't, they, they don't take account of. Some machines are big engines or little engines such as Spark64 and i386. Some machines are 64-bit, other 32-bit. What this means is that int is going to be 32-bit in both cases, but long, while it's 32-bit on i386, it is 64-bit on AMD64, Spark64. This is actually a big problem because in a lot of software, people mix up int and long, and they assign one to the other. They don't really think about it because they're both 32-bit. On a 64-bit machine, now your long variable can suddenly be very big, and if you assign it to the int, you get it truncated. So it causes integer overflows and interesting things like that. And there's been exploits of this kind. Also, char. Char is not actually guaranteed to be signed. We have one platform, Mac PC, and there's at least one other, which we don't support, where char is unsigned by default. Now, this should normally cause no problem because the char is only, only used to store characters, right? Well, 
I've actually seen several pieces of software which use a char to store a small integer because they think, oh, I'm, my integer is going to be really small, so I can just be optimized in just one byte instead of four, which is completely unacceptable, but people don't think about it. And now suddenly you're storing a minus one. I actually saw a piece of code which uses, which stored minus one in a, in a character. And on Mac, if you see, this went to 255. And this caused very interesting behavior. <laughs> We also have one architecture where the stack actually grows up instead of down. And this is kind of a hard question, but do any of you know which one that is? Do any of you know what an architecture like that? Go ahead. Sorry? Uh, I don't think so. No. Uh, at least on OpenBSD it doesn't. Maybe it has a mode. Hmm. You can feel free to correct me. Well, there's one by, there may possibly be more, but the other one we support is made by HP. Does that help? <laughs> well, there's, there's an HP risk architecture called HPPA. And that's it. And uh, I wouldn't notice if I, in, if I didn't have this machine at home. <laughs> <laughs> there's also a lot of architectures have the requirement that each memory access has to be aligned. And uh, so your structures have to be page aligned. And uh, that's also uncovers a lot of bugs. The nastiest architecture for, for finding these types of things is Spark 64. Spark 64 is big engine, integers 32 bit, but longs and pointers are 64 bit. It's actually, when I say the nastiest, it's actually my favorite. Because when you run your, some application on Spark 64, it uncovers the most amount of bugs. So when you write your code, it's very good to test it on Spark 64. And these days, you can actually go to, uh, you can get one off eBay for 100 bucks or something. It's because people are selling them pretty cheap. You can also go probably dumpster diving around the university. The university, I'm sure, is throwing out some. <laughs> and they're cool to have. <laughs> OK, so uh, in this talk, I sort of talked about some of the compiler changes that we've done and how they've helped us. I also talked some of the memory protection things, such as an non-executable stack and WRXRX. We also showed you how randomization, we've randomized so many th parts of our system, and malloc guard pages. All of these have found a lot of bugs, especially in third-party software, but even in our base system. And with this, uh, I would like just to say thanks for having me here. I really enjoyed this. And uh, I would like to thank the, all the OpenBSD developers. And I would like to mention also that this is a completely volunteer-based project. Uh, we're supported by donations, and we sell CDs and T-shirts. In fact, today I have 4.2 CDs, which are released on November 1st, which hasn't happened yet. And uh, I'm going to be selling them here cheaper than the website for 10 bucks off for $40. <laughs> and uh, at this point, anybody wants to ask questions? So when you were talking about the um, malloc guard page stuff, do they use the MMU to do one malloc guard page and set it as read only? and then map that same page everywhere that you need to have that? Or do they waste a page every time that you have a malloc in every program? I think it's actually, it actually wastes a page. But it's not like it's a big deal these days. I'm not 100% sure, though. One question I had was about the uh, the read or execute, and in some cases, isn't there code that like if the code needs to modify itself during execution, would that be an issue where you need to re write and execute? Oh, like just-in-time compilers? Uh, yeah, something like that. Even or just say. Yeah. So I actually should have put this on the slide. There's something really important. You can actually your program can use these system calls called mprotect, and you can you can force a certain memory location, a region, to be both writable and executable if you need it. So these types of, so it's actually a requirement that you have to run this, to specify this first. So it's a very good question, because otherwise we would break stuff like that, yeah.
You guys should grab the posters. <laughs> yeah, just pick one. You're here first, so you don't have to. <laughs> and there are also stickers on the table there.